morning. We thank you so much for the Book of Acts that you inspired, that you have included um, in the New Testament because it is, it helps us. It's a blessing. It, it, Lord, we look forward to this study. And so, Lord, as we come now this morning to the time that we have to, to study the study this book and the author of this book, the earthly author of this book, Lord, give us a focus, I pray. Give us a clear understanding. Help us to keep our eyes on what you have for us this day. And Lord, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, uh, and conform us and do in us everything that you have planned to do for this Sunday morning, in these 30 minutes, every one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So over the last few weeks, thank you. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and don't want to go back into that again. We've, um, but we've, we've looked at how the Holy Spirit brings us to the point of making a decision for Christ. And some people make a, make a decision for Christ. There are some that the Holy Spirit brings to the decision point and they say, no, this is not what I want. They want their own way. They want to, they want to run their own lives, never realizing that they are not running their own lives and they're not free and they're not independent when they choose uh, a way apart from God. But the Holy Spirit works to bring us to that. And then we talked about what He does at the moment of salvation, the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, bringing us into the family of God, making us, putting, the, God giving His a precious deposit in our lives. That's, that's who the Holy Spirit is, and that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's God's deposit, um, and it's a guarantee. We talked about that. It's a guarantee. It's a down payment. It is, um, it is something that, that promises us, that guarantees the inheritance that is yet to come. And then the last two weeks, we talked about what the Holy Spirit does to keep us saved, to, to bring us all the way to the full experience of salvation, which is yet to come. The Holy Spirit is still at work. He is in you now, and in the Holy Spirit in you guarantees, brothers and sisters, guarantees that one day you will receive all that God has promised you, you will. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad for that? We have so many guarantees in this world that look nice on a piece of paper and they're worthless, aren't they? They're worthless. Guaranteed for 10 years and it lasts two months. Um, guaranteed to do this and it doesn't do anything. Um, but the guarantee of God in the Holy Spirit is certain, is sure. We're so grateful. So how do we get from talking about the Holy Spirit to, and now we're going to look at the book of Acts. We're going to talk about that this morning, but it's a very, as we look at this, as we look at uh, the beginning of Acts and Luke this morning, we're going to see why going into the book of Acts is such a, is such a, uh, no-brainer is what, is what we would say in English. It's a logical, it's a logical step, and the Holy Spirit has led me, uh, has led me in this way. So I want to, as we begin, uh, and if you want to, you've got your, you've got your book. Take time to read it later. But if you want to, you can turn to the page that says "Fast Facts on Acts." Okay, and that will be your third page, I think. Yeah. Your third page, so I'll be um, I'll be talking from there a little bit, and there's some places for you to write notes if you want to, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but it's a good way it's a good way to kind of keep remembering all all the things. And I want us this morning to talk about a few of the fast facts about Acts. There's much much more than this, and we'll get into it next week as well. But let's talk first. Okay, next slide. The fast facts on Acts. Let's talk about the author of the book of Acts for, uh, for uh, very briefly. Who's the author? Luke is the author. Okay, Luke is the author. Does it say anywhere in the book of Acts that I, Luke, have written this book? Does it say it anywhere? No. Nowhere in the book of Acts, but we have we have strong assurance for a variety of reasons to know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. What else do we know about Luke, the earthly writer of this book? What are some things what are some things that we know? Now, if you're in the first service, you have to hold on. Give second service people a chance to answer. Okay? Let's see how they do. Okay. Were you in the first service? No. Okay. So he's a doctor, first of all. How do we know he's a doctor, Ying? 
because the Bible says so. <laughs> okay, yeah. You can always say because God said so. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, and if you'll look in Colossians 4.14, I don't have the scripture, but on your own. Colossians 4.14, Paul writes about Luke and he says in Colossians 4.14, the beloved, if you have an, uh, depending on your translation, the beloved physician or the dear doctor. Dear doctor. So that's something that we know about Luke. And I want us to think about that just a minute because there's only one, that's just one small verse that tells us something about Luke. But there are wonderful things there as we think about that. So Luke is a doctor, just as Dr. Jin Fu, who was in the first service this morning, is a doctor, is a, med a medical doctor uh, of that day. Sometimes they were. Uh, they were wealthy, depending on the type of work that they did. Sometimes they had been slaves that were freed. They were always highly educated if they were a doctor using the medicine of that day. But in Colossians 4.14, Paul writes about my beloved, doc beloved Dr. Luke, if you want to, or dear Dr. Luke. And I want you to think about that just a minute as we think about Luke. He's a doctor. What's he doing writing part of the New Testament. He's a doctor. He should be doing doctoring. Here's this great thing we see as we come to the New Testament. God uses the gifts that he gives us. There are natural gifts that you and I have. There are spiritual gifts as well. But when we take what we have and what we are and we say, God, here I am and here is all of me. You have all of me, God. Then we and all we have and all we are are in God's hands and in God's disposal to use in any way he wants to bless the body of Christ, to do, to do all sorts of things. So Luke is a doctor. We sometimes think, I've got this gift, I've got this talent, I've got this ability, but it's not a spiritual one, and so it can't be used for God. It's just what I do and it's what I am. The Bible doesn't teach us that at all, and Luke shows us that. So Luke is a doctor. He could have made a lot more money than doing what he did. And I want you to think for just a minute about the blessing that Luke is to Paul. Because the Bible also tells us that Luke makes it very, he's, it's very clear, Luke was a companion of Paul on several of his missionary journeys. Even though Luke writes much of the New Testament, his name is only mentioned by name only three times in the whole New Testament. How can this be? Because if you will look, you will see in the fast facts as well that Luke writes more of the New Testament than any other writer of the New Testament. Did you know that? Luke writes more of the New Testament than Paul. How can that be? And yet God takes a man with a secular job, if you will, and because Luke is obviously sold out to God, God is able to use him for specific purposes. And he's a companion of Paul for several of the journeys. The three places where Luke's name is mentioned, it's always in relation to one of Paul's imprisonments, one of his jailings. And to me, that tells me even more about Luke, and it tells us even more about God's plan and God's provision um, in, in making Luke and Paul companions. Because, brothers and sisters, the work of ministry, the work of evangelism, God's work, we sometimes over-spiritualize it, don't we? We sometimes say, oh, it's just, just pray. It takes prayer. Prayer, as we're going to see in the, in the book of Acts, it, there must be prayer. That's the foundation. But prayer is not the only part of God's work. There are practical parts to evangelism. There are practical parts to ministry and to missions. And without those practical parts, the work of God cannot be fully carried out as God intends. And that's why God puts gifts in his people, in his church, things that look very, very natural at times. But it's part of God's gifting and blessing to his church so that God's church and God's work may be carried out in the way that God plans. May I give you an example? There was one of the missionaries in the Philippines that I, I love them all, but I loved this one and I was praying for her and I was praying for her and really praying for her and I loved to read about what she was doing. And then I think when I went to visit went to visit her and I visited all of them so you don't know which one it is I looked at her shoes and I was 
horrified. I'm not praising me, I'm just giving you an example. I was horrified because I knew that this one missionary went through the fields, went door to door all of the time, all of the time, all of the week, and I looked at the shoes she was wearing. They're fine, but they were little, almost like flip-flops with no support, no, no, nothing. I mean, just little plastic, little plastic, whatever. And I looked up and I was really horrified. I thought, you're walking through the fields miles every, miles every day in those. And so I happened to be wearing a pair at, on that time, which I often do when I go to the Philippines because it can be really dirty and really muddy. I was wearing a pair of thick Crocs. You know, those American shoes that are everywhere, right? <laughs> that, a lot, that a lot of people don't care for. But it was a pair, not, not flat ones, but it was a pair of thick ones with really good support. And I said, oh, these are really comfortable because I have some feet problems. And she looked at them and she said, oh, I said, would something like this help you? And she said, oh, yes. I said, okay, what size do you wear? And I came back to Hong Kong, bought them. They had them here at the Croc store and sent them to her. And when I went back to, vi I've been back to visit her two, three years later, she's still wearing them. And she said, I wear them all the time. And she said, they're so easy. They're so easy, she said, because you know, they cover my toes. And some of my toes aren't pretty sometimes. Those of you who are Filipino know what I mean. If you don't have pretty toes, people will judge you, right? <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Did you know that, Pastor Renee? Yes. Is it true? Yes. See? <laughs> You didn't know that. Janice says, what? Yes, Miss Janice, it's true. Got to have pretty toes. And so this missionary said, it keeps my toes covered and they're plastic so I can wash them when they get dusty and they give me good support and they're still lasting. Now, what's all the point of that? The work of the Lord takes practical things as well, brothers and sisters. And that's why we not only pray for missions and ministry and evangelism, we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and we're led by the Holy Spirit to do practical things as well in the work of the ministry. It's required. We see that with Dr. Luke here, who was a doctor companion for Paul. We know that Paul had problems with his eyes. We know that Paul was beaten and left for dead more than once. We know that he was shipwrecked. We know that he was imprisoned. We know that all sorts of things happened to him. And for much of it, he had Dr. Luke by his side. How wonderful God was to bring these two men together. And the added benefit and the added blessing of their partnership was we get much of the book of Acts because Luke was there when it happened. So that's something we know about Dr. Luke. What else do we know about Dr. Luke? Anybody else? You're not sure or you think maybe? Was he Jewish or not Jewish? As far as we know, he was not Jewish. You say, what? He was not Jewish? No, he was not Jewish. And I really like that because Acts shows the gospel, the truth, the word of God spreading from the Jews to the Gentile world. And guess what? Dr. Luke, who wasn't Jewish, is the one who writes that. Isn't God good? He puts things together. Dr. Luke, as far as we know, was not Jewish, was not Jewish. We don't know if he was Greek or not, but his Greek was very, very good. His Greek is better than Paul's Greek. In fact, his Greek writing is as good as any of the classical writers of his day. So he's very, very educated. And because the book of Acts was mainly for non-Jews, then it's even better that the, that the Greek in which it's written is something that they can really respect and admire as they read it. So that's a little bit more as we know about Luke. Do we know anything else about Luke? We know that he wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer, including Paul, as we said. And that's because, that's because, um, as we look at these other things as well, uh, we see that he also wrote the, the Gospel of what? The Gospel of Luke. So when you put the Gospel of Luke together with the book of Acts, that is more of the New Testament than Paul himself wrote, and that's what God inspired. Okay, let's look at a few other things. Um, click, click, us, click on the next one. It was written around 63 AD. You say, is that important? I kind of think it's important, because that's right about the time that Paul, who was a prisoner in Rome, was released from prison. 
right around that time. Do you think that Mr. Paul, who was going, 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 going all the time, do you think that he might have slowed down in prison and had time to tell Dr. Luke about some of the things that happened? And Dr. Luke took notes. I think so. I think so. So it's written around 63 AD. Okay, what else do we see? Let's look at the next thing. There are many accurate details. How many of you are good with details? I am not particularly great with details, but there are people in this church who are great with details, who will remember everything. Sometimes during the week when we're up working on the fourth floor, I'll look at, she's not here now, she's upstairs now, I'll look at Melrose and I'll say, Melrose, we need to whatever. And she looks at me and she almost rolls her eyes and she says, already done, Pastor. She's way ahead of us. I praise the Lord for someone that is great with details who has partnered with us to help. She makes things work smoothly and well. The same could be said of Dr. Luke. He was a detail person. He was a great historian. And if you look at this, there are many, many accurate details in the book of Acts. There are more than 100 place names that are accurate and that Luke talks about this is how long it took to get from here to here and this is how we traveled. And anybody reading the book of Acts would have known, yeah, that's right, that's true. Not only that, Dr. Luke, the great historian with great detail, also lists more than 100 personal names. I challenged the first, the first service and they, everybody looked at me and kind of went, ha, ha, ha. and I'm the same way. How many of you in Lighthouse, we have close to 200 people in Lighthouse, how many of you could accurately, right now, name around 100 people in Lighthouse? 100 people, accurately. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> we're all laughing because maybe one of us could. But I can tell you, it wouldn't be the pastors, right? Sometimes I'll say, Pastor Renee, what, what's that person's name? I say, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then we'll go ask somebody and say, I don't know, but I'll find out. So, you know, we have so many people at, at Lighthouse, we come and go or whatever. Don't be shy about saying, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember your name. I'm Flora. What's your name? And then Iris will say, I'm Iris, right in front of you or whatever. It's a good way rather than, than trying to, we always want to save face, don't we? Don't want anyone to know. Yeah, we do. But Luke was a great historian and very accurate. And God used that. God used that. Okay, what are some other things that we see? Uh, fast facts for Acts, that it's a two-part, and we'll look at that in just a minute. The Gospel of Luke and Acts. Those are the two. And this was common in the world at that time. It was very common to write uh, a two-volume work. And that's what Luke does. The, the Greeks and the Romans did that very commonly. So we've got, we've got Luke and then we've got Acts. And we'll see that shortly. And then, what about some of the themes? If you're looking, but don't look yet. It's on the, very la it's on the last page back there. But let me ask you first. What do you think, second service people, what are some themes of the book of Acts? Just from what you know of the book of Acts. What do you think? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You got it. Holy Spirit is one of the major themes of the book of Acts. Anyone else? Some other themes. What? Evangelism or missions. Absolutely, that's one of the themes. Anybody else? The church. That's right. The word ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, is used 23 times in the book of Acts. 23 times. And so we, we find out about that as well. Because that's when the church is established. Now there's some other ones as well. But I've given you a place to write so that you can add to it as we study together and as we read together. You'll come back to this one. So these are some of the things um, that we see. Just fast facts on Acts. But I want you to think with me just a minute as we think about the book of Acts. And our time is short this morning, so I promise I'll speak more slowly next week. We're going fast this morning. The way to, to understand how important the book of Acts is, is to consider your New Testament without the book of Acts. Think about it. Open up your Bible this morning. You're going to read from the New Testament. And you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then you've got... Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so on, but no Acts. How would we understand the New Testament without the book of Acts? That tells us something about the importance of Acts. We'd have the four Gospels telling us about Jesus, his teachings, his miracles, and the group of disciples he called to follow them. And then suddenly, 
we'd have the rest of the New Testament written by someone we've never met, never heard of before, written to believers in places we've never heard of before either. We would be wondering, where's Jerusalem? And we'd be wondering, why are, why are all these Christians in Rome? Why is this book written to Roman Christians? We'd be wondering, what about the Jewish believers? Why are there all these Gentile believers? How did that happen? We would be reading, rather than a small group of Jesus followers, we'd be reading mostly about Gentile believers. And we'd mostly be thinking, who is this man named Paul and where did he come from? Acts bridges the gap. Now that's just a fit, that's, those are just simple ways. There's a much more wonderful way that Acts bridges the gap between these two, between the Gospels and the letters. But if we didn't have Acts, we wouldn't know those things. We'd be trying to figure it out. Now how did that happen? Why did that happen? And as we look at that, the book of Acts explains all of this and more. And it's a bridge from the Gospels to the letters. The Gospels of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew, Gospels of Mark and Matthew end with Jesus telling his disciples, go out and preach, make disciples of all nations. I promise I'll be with you to the end of the age. And then Jesus leaves them. He leaves them. He's gone. Think with me for just a minute. The task that he gives them is all but impossible. All of the Jewish religious organization is opposed to them, has, has crucified the one that they have followed. They have no money, they have no buildings, they have no organizations, they have no leader, they have no New Testament. Think about that. How many of you, if all you had in your Christian life was the Old Testament, how encouraged would you be? Just the Old Testament. Now, it's God's Word. It's inspired. But when you got up this morning, this morning when I got up early, I listened to part of Acts. I listened to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And in the car, I listened to First and Second Thessalonians on the way. And I was just enjoying it as I came. There wouldn't be any of that. There wouldn't be any of that. They didn't have that. They did not have all of the teaching that you and I find so, so foundational for our Christian lives. How are they going to carry out their command from Jesus, this command from Jesus? The key is in two things. The first is in the promise of Jesus. And I want you to understand that this morning because brothers and sisters, we're not just looking back in history. You and I have been given things to do by God. God has called you to do certain things. Called, God has called you to be in a certain way. God calls you to forgive people who have not asked for forgiveness. God has called you to love people who are not lovely. God has called you to be patient in when everything in you, you want to be impatient. God has called you to works that you think, God, how can I do that? How are you and I going to do the hard, the difficult, the impossible things that God calls us to do? And he does. Brothers and sisters, if we could live our Christian lives in all of our natural ability, it wouldn't be Christian life. Because Christian life is supernatural life. It's beyond natural. It's beyond our ability. It's beyond what we have. It's beyond what we can do. And if we can do it with what we have, and if we can do it in our own strength, then it is not fully what God has called us to do. God calls us to do more than we can do. He calls us to go beyond the boundaries of what we have and what we are and what's in our bank accounts and what's in our hearts and what's in our thoughts. It's more than we have. How are we going to do what God calls us to do? We find the key in the book of Acts. Look with me. The first key was this. The promise of Jesus. The next slide. The promise of Jesus. He would send the Father just as he would send what the Father had promised. So the first thing we see, and we already know this so well, but it's a key, and we need to see it. Je Jesus says to them, I'm going to send you a gift. 
It's the one that the Father has promised. You've heard me talk about it. I'm going to send in a few days. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you'll receive power when He comes upon you, when you are baptized. And then, I'm adding some words, but you understand, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So God gives a promise to the people that He has called. They've got something they have to do. There are things that you have to do, but God does not leave you and me. He doesn't leave us on our own. You don't have to forgive that unforgiving person in your own power and your own strength. You can't do it. I can't either. But beyond that, there are works of evangelism. There are works of missions in Indonesia and other places. How are you going to do it? If you do it in your own strength, you will not make it. You will be defeated. You'll want to give up. Some of you this week, I put it on the prayer on the prayer chain with our dear sister Kelly that we only met one Sunday who's working in Afghanistan. I started reading the newsletters that she sent asking for very specific prayer this week and I just thought, <gasps> just so far beyond the possibility in the flesh. And those of you that say, what, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You should be getting her newsletters as well. Just, you just, it sounds like the book of Acts. It really does. And I thought, Lord, how can this be? And then she, she wrote back later thanking us for the prayers and just saying, I'm just, I'm just eating the word of God and I'm just waiting in his presence all the time. It's the only way I can make it. It's the only way I can make it. And so we see this promise, this promise of God, things that are impossible for us to do, but he promises. But brothers and sisters, that's not all. There's the promise of God for you and for me as there was for them. But there must be obedience on our part to the promises of God. Jesus says, the promise is coming, but you have to wait. Oh my gracious. How many of us like to wait? How many, there we go. How many of us instead, we've got it all figured out, I've got a plan. And we start full of activity, full of activity, full of, I can do it, I can do it, I can do this and I can do that. We don't wait on God. We barely wait for him to whisper, this is what I want you to do. And off we go fulfill the work of God. That is not the way that we see in Acts. And Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive what I've promised. And then what do we see next? So there's the first key. The second key is this. Next slide. The apostles, Jesus leaves. They return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance half a mile. They arrived. They went to the upstairs room. Okay, who is in that upstairs room? Let's see if they obeyed what Jesus said. Peter. <gasps> Praise the Lord. He starts with Peter. You know how much I love my brother Peter. Of all of the disciples, which disciple would be most likely to jump up in his own energy and his own strength and do what, God, what Jesus has told them to do? Who? Peter. That's right. But it tells us who was there waiting. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Barth Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Not Judas Iscariot. He's gone at this point. Okay. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus, other women, the brothers of Jesus. The brothers of Jesus who were part of his family. That's James and who? Jude. And there may have been others, but James and Jude are the ones we know about, who did not even believe in Jesus until after his death and resurrection. So if you are praying for family members that are not yet saved, you don't give up. Sometimes it takes time. It takes time. But they're all there, and they're waiting. And what does it do? They were, what do they do? They were constantly united in prayer. And here's the key that we see. Jesus promises. Here's the provision for you to do what I'm calling you to do. But you've got to wait. It's my way. In, in effect, Jesus is saying, you are not in charge. I'm in charge. It's his church, brothers and sisters. It's his work. It's his mission. It's his message. And if we do it in ourselves and of ourselves, we will be less than successful. But we do it according to the plan and the timing of Jesus. And Acts shows us the earthly life and ministry of Jesus in the flesh, moving from that to the continued works of Jesus in the lives of his followers through the indwelling and the empowering Holy Spirit. He sends his messengers with the same message he proclaimed. Brothers and sisters, he sends you and me 
with the same message that he proclaimed. There's no different message. It's the message of Jesus. And we have to wait on Jesus through the Holy Spirit in prayer and the filling of the Holy Spirit to know what that message, to get that message deep in us and to have the power. Jesus provided to his messengers the same power through which he himself ministered. How did Jesus do all that he did as he walked this earth? Oh, we could say, oh, because he was Jesus, the Son of God. Yes, he was the Son of God, but you look at Luke, it says he was what? Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. That's the only way. And when we look at Acts, we see, let's look at the next slide, this shows us. In Acts, it says, in my first book I told you, we'll talk about Theophilus next week, what a name, don't name your son Theophilus, although it's a really great name, it's a really great name, it means friend of God or one who loves God, a lover of God, it's, it's actually a great name, maybe you call him Theo for short. <coughs> in my first book, I, I told you about everything, look at this, that Jesus what? began to do and teach until he was taken up. What does that mean? It means he began, that's the book of what? Luke. Okay, look at the next one. Oh, okay. Luke says, I've decided to write a careful account. We'll come back to this next week so you can be certain. And he says, in the first book, I began to write about what Jesus began to do and teach. What that means, brothers and sisters, and what it implies very clearly is this. Jesus began, and in Acts, he continues. How can he continue? At the very beginning verses of Acts, Jesus goes to heaven. And yet Jesus said, I'm with you always. How can that be? Jesus continues his work and his teaching Though he is in heaven, he continues in them, and he continues in you and me. His works and his teaching and his ministry through the power of the indwelling and empowering Holy Spirit. He is the only way, he is the only way that we can do the works of God. He is the only way that we can show Jesus to a world that will die and go to hell if they don't hear and see Jesus in you and me. Paul and Peter are long gone, brothers and sisters. Long gone. James, John, all of them. Long gone. Who's going to share Jesus? Who's going to show Jesus? Who's going to speak Jesus? Who's going to go where Jesus would go? You and I. You and I are going to. But it's got to be His way, with His power. And Acts shows us how. It challenges us. It encourages us. We come to a close. We'll pick up just a little bit and continue. But I want to encourage you this morning, if you are, and that's why we've, we close with this, if you say, I am no Peter and I am no Paul, I'm not like them. I'm an ordinary Christian. And Lighthouse is kind of an ordinary church. I encourage you this morning. Peter, oh my goodness. Think of Brother Peter. And yet, the Holy Spirit transformed his life. And he is the first part that we read about for the first half, almost, of Acts. And then, oh, I'm no Paul. You're right. You are no Paul. Very clearly, you're no Paul, but you know what I mean by that? You're not a murderer, and Paul was. You're not a Paul. But the power of the Holy Spirit transformed a murderer into one who brought the message of life. The Holy Spirit breathes through God's unfinished book. I encourage you and challenge you Join me as we walk through this book, God's unfinished book. We're part of it. We're part of it. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that encouraging? We get to be part of this book. Lord, we thank you for our dear Dr. Luke that we're going to meet one day in heaven. 
Show us how we can use the gifts that you give us, the natural things that you have put in our lives, and the supernatural things as well. How all that we have and all that we are given to you may be used for your purposes and for your glory. Show us how to do that, we pray. And Lord, this week, as we begin to dig into this wonderful book of Acts, open our eyes, we pray. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Challenge us. Don't let us be content and complacent with where we are. We're good enough. Lord, you have more. Open our eyes to the more that you have for us. In the, na in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Be reading the book of Acts, especially chapters 1.